Luke chapter number 18. Praise the Lord. Leave that card right up there for a moment. Let me, let me just take a minute to come back to extol the Lord as we were, of course, doing that. And we do every Sunday morning. We sing praises unto the Lord. And, and we really went after, um, well, a God-directed theme for our Acts 1A conference. It always is. And, and in this case this year, it was uh, centered up on our heart of worship, our life of worship. Um, often as, and I've even spoken this, uh, I think it may be even used as a title of a message, just stealing it from somebody else, but the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And oftentimes it's about just simply having our relationship with God in the right place to do mission work. And uh, Kevin Pesky, just thank the Lord for a man who's a shepherd's heart, who is a missionary in the field for 11 years, and of course, uh, what God has done to grow him in preaching and teaching the Word of God. He's a friend of our church and uh, like-minded when it comes to the Word of God and the gospel and the mission work that we're part of. And I want to remind you of how we've been committed to missions since um, long before uh, I've uh, had the honor and privilege of being your pastor. But uh, for 27 years plus, we have been committed to supporting missionaries, going on short-term mission trips or uh, headed out to um, Argentina in a couple weeks uh, this past Friday. So two weeks uh, we'll be in Argentina. Looking forward to being with Cody Walker, who, of course, was able to be at our Acts 1A conference. Brian Clark Friday night did just a great job in a few minutes of saying thank you with great gratitude and, and having Lee and Heather Carter, and they'll be back around here a little bit. Uh, because of family, and uh, but they'll go back to the Decatur area and other places in November, but we'll see them a couple more times, and I'm going to have him share a little bit of the work here, but having this missions conference again reminds us that that red-hot passion and closeness to God can overflow into being involved in missions and missionaries. We're, uh, as we say, often an Acts 1-8 church, and we believe in the Acts one eight mission of our church in here are missionaries names here very important that you're reminded of that list we support those missionaries around seven thousand dollars a month plus all the other designated offerings that are special and they go to them some people might give a hundred dollars to a, a missionary in addition to our monthly support as a church and we just send it right off to the missionaries well that leads me to the card that's around you. The only thing you need to do with this is pick it up, put it in your Bible, put it in your pocket, and pray. Begin to pray over, of course, the mission work of your church and what we're involved in and that we can continue to do so. Uh, missionaries need monies, just as you need monies to eat and to have transport and to pay the bills for your house. And so that's, we support missionaries on the field who have given up a whole lot to say this is what God would have us to do, and they don't speak of their sacrifice uh, more than any other. On the back it says, First Bible Baptist Church General Missions Fund. I'd love to have you say, hey, I can, I can, I've been given for a year or two or three. I'd like to continue to do that. Well, check it off. Put your name. I will make sure to have the basket up here next Sunday for the balance of the year out into January as we take our commitments. Also, you can put it in our little offering. Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Plate. Plate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You'll be 65 someday. <laughs> the simplest word, plate. Well, I know why I couldn't remember, because I could never throw it over the plate. Ha, 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 ha. stop it. Or when I threw it over the plate, it happened. Well, anyway, you see the second family here. They're intentionally on this card, of course. I would like to have us as a church really, really be in their corner. They are our sent out missionaries. We spent a few days, a few weeks with them really around First Bible for a few months, and we had a, a Bible conference, um, serious things. We looked at 
uh, the Word of God and work, looked into the Word of God and missions as well, plus, of course, the Word of God and its importance to search the Scriptures daily. Alex is a preacher, preacher of the Word of God, a gospel man, a church planning man. There's already people that have gotten saved through the work that Crystal and the girls and, of course, Pastor Alex are doing. We laid hands on them and, and sent them out of this church. And we are to support them. And starting in, I know already some of you are supporting, and you can do that. If you go on our online contribution platform, they are one of, the, uh, one of the buttons you can click to give. I would like to have us really commit to supporting them at a place in which God would lead and direct so they can have the ability to do all that God would have them to do. They have other churches supporting them, but let's make sure that we're in their corner in a strong way. So pray over this card through the end of this year and uh, we'll be taking them in over the next few weeks, but maybe we'll put a big nudge on it the middle of December into the 1st of January. So, okay, this is where we're committed. Then our mission support team will get together and say, hey, this is the amount of monies we have this year to be able to maybe give a little more, or however we're sitting, we'll be able to communicate with Alex. Hey, this is how our church is able to support you uh, beyond just already some people supporting since April but even more of a couple, two, three-year commitment, just as we supported Brian Calloway, our sent-out missionary, back a few years ago. Luke chapter number 18, you have a head start on me, I'm sure, from get, for getting there. Um, I'm going to see if I can find it in my Bible. Uh, let me see, Luke, 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 plate, plate, plate. There we go, see, there we go. See, it's still all there. There's still a little bit left in there. Luke 18, verse number one. We're going to dig into uh, our study. And again, we were here two Sundays ago. Then again, Pastor Kevin preached our missions conference and again did a great job. The extol the Lord, praise enthusiastically, enthusiastic prayers, praise on Sunday night. Real quick, some of you have the Facebook thing. Others can just, you can go on YouTube. First Bible ADP is our YouTube channel and you can uh, partake in all of those messages. I've already gone out there and checked them all out. They're already out there. And the Sunday evening one, just turn up your volume a little bit, but you can hear the, the singing and the praise of the Lord. Uh, that was 62 minutes of an incredible time. And I'm glad that so many of you were part of that. And I know some of you could not, or hey, but send somebody the link to go look at it. Look at it yourself to be part of it. But we return back to Luke chapter number 18. We finished up 17. And let me just read a quick verse from 17 to remind you of the setting. I like doing that. Verse number 20 says in Luke 17, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. And of course he gets into the kingdom of God, neither shall they say, lo, here or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And of course, we spoke about this two Sundays ago, that God's kingdom people, they understand and, and have the ability to worship Jesus Christ, worship the holy God in a very, very extra special way, because Jesus Christ tore down the wall of partition at the cross, the resurrection, completed the work for the kingdom. When you're born again, when you're a new creature in Christ, old things pass away, behold, all things have become new. You now are in the spiritual kingdom. And so we preached on that. We finished it out talking about what it means, the signs of the end times, all those things. We looked at really the idea that, hey, don't sit on your laurels and just sit on your hands. Introduce people to Jesus Christ and have them come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. And then they enter into the kingdom of God. And now they're not part of the kingdom of of this world. They're not part of the kingdom of destruction. They're part of God's kingdom. I read a couple of quotes last time, two weeks ago. Let me just remind you of what happened in that text before we get into Luke 18. Dwight Pentecost, read, read a lot of, J. Dwight Pentecost has written a lot of books on, um, on futurism and on the coming and the second advent, and the second coming and all that. Here's one of his quotes. This seems to have been, this particular text, in the nature of a challenge from the Pharisees. The Pharisees were implying that of Jesus. If Jesus was what he had been claiming for so long, he should prove his claim by instituting the kingdom without further delay. 
See, they wanted the physical kingdom. I think also, too, someday, sometimes we, we walk around as believers and say, I just want the physical kingdom. Well, you are, and that's, that's fine. But you and I, and being born again, we're in the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom. Everything will come together in God's time. But understand this, as people are pushing Jesus to come up with all these things that they want, Jesus is teaching the Pharisees and the crowd, but is also teaching his disciples his last important thoughts. Today, I want you to grab a hold of this idea of little things are big to Jesus. Why that title? Because we're going to look at some little things that tie into the big thing of this text, which is prayer. We haven't spoken of prayer since, uh, I believe, the last time when the disciples said, Jesus, uh, teach us to pray. And of course, he taught them to pray in Luke 11. And we understand that Jesus Christ repetitively brings up important things that he wants his disciples to get a hold of. The question is, do we want to get a hold of the things <laughs> that Jesus Christ wanted the disciples to get a hold of 2,000 years ago? You cannot be my disciple if you do not hate all those other things and yourself to love him and him alone. Being his disciple is very, very important. This audience is grasping that, of course, from Luke chapter number 9 to the end of it to Luke chapter number 19, the middle part of it to the end of it, is, it really teaches us the last stuff that Jesus was teaching his disciples before he got to the cross, his passion, suffering, weak. And you and I, again, in Luke 18, are going to grab some little things that are big to Jesus because the little things make prayer a big thing. Let me pray with you real quick. Let me just, let's just pray for a moment, then we'll get into the Word of God and really knock this thing out and see what God has for us. Holy God, we just uh, want to stop right now. We've already had some time of praise. We've prayed a little bit already collectively and corporately. And, and so now, Holy God, my Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, uh, I just, uh, I simply thank you, bring you great gratitude an attitude of gratitude over what you have done in my life, this church's life, and the people that I know. Thank you for being faithful all the time, being good all the time, forgiving, cleaning things up, giving us a salvation that is eternal. It is complete and perfect in Jesus and the kingdom of God. And today as we open up the text and look at some little things that might make our prayer life a much bigger thing. I pray that you will just direct and lead the words that are spoken today. Have your word, most of all, just simply be preeminent as it deserves and as it does do. It's not bound, and so, God, have your way. I thank you for everyone being here today. Make each of us better by your word, by the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Verse number one, chapter 18. And he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So here's another parable. I call it, a, you, you can call it both. I, in, in terms of the text today and the application of our message, I, I call it the uh, parable of the persistent widow. It's also the parable of the unjust judge. Think about what this starts out as, men ought always to pray, not to faint. Okay? Let's do it. Saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said unto himself, Though I fear not God great judge this guy is, nor regard man, don't care about people, don't fear God, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Now consider what that means in the Jewish culture and what is saying in the meaning in your Bible, that she would not weary me. That doesn't mean that, you know, she's just wearing me out. It means more than that. 
that he would end up receiving a mark on his face, in fact, a black eye, for his treatment of her, how he poorly treated her. You see, you're in, being invited by Jesus into an incredible contrast, not a comparison. He is the just judge. He is the one that will hear matters. He is the one that will judge. He will listen to prayer. But this guy, he's an unjust judge. And this persistent widow, she, he's basically saying, I don't fear God. I don't fear anybody. I really don't care. But so that she doesn't make me look bad, I'll do what she asks me to do. And the Lord said, verse number six, hear what the unjust, say, unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night with him, though he bear long with them? The elect in this case, the nation of Israel, the term elect in your scriptures helps you to understand that those that have call out to the Lord, the elect in the New Testament, they now belong. And now as you and I call out to the Lord to save us and choose him, now we're part of his chosen sons of God. Similarly, the nation of Israel, by their covenant from God and God's covenant toward them, they are his elect. They belong to him. He's chosen them and chosen them for an incredible purpose. Very important. If you want to understand the depths of what elect means, send me an email as I invite you and we'll talk through it and look into the scriptures. Or we could do that right now, and it'll be about a two-hour Bible lesson, if you'd like. We can do that right now. You want to do that right now? Okay, we're going to do that. Okay. Michael, you must not have anywhere to go. That's all right. There you go, buddy. It's very important because Jesus is saying something. Shall not God avenge his own elect? He'll take care of his people. He says, I will take care of my chosen. I'll take care of the elect. I'll take care. And he's referring to Israel. But anyone who becomes a believer, that's another pocket and package of the elect through the covenant, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse number eight, I will tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the son of man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Hmm, going back over to the end of Luke 17, you see, Jesus is constantly warning of his first coming, his second coming and saying, hey, where are you going to be with your faith? I put that out to you and me. We're so concerned about everyone else when God wants us just to really attend to him and deal with things that he's dealing with in our own hearts. That's the point of his parable teaching here, especially when we have the disciples in the audience. Verse 9 through 14. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Now count the words that he says, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican, you awful tax collector, Verse 12, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but spoke upon his breast saying, God, one, be two, merciful, three, two, four, me, five, a, six, sinner, seven, seven, words Jesus speaks now in the parable and finishing in 14 saying this I tell you this man went down to his house of course he's left the tabernacle he's left the temple he's left the setting so this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Whew, that's some good stuff, Jesus. <laughs> he knows how to teach. You see, a goes without saying truth in Jesus 
whatever, and Luke, whatever was most important for Jesus to teach his disciples, he made sure they heard it a lot. I put something up like this every probably two or three messages. He's teaching them at a deep, deep level, but also very simple, straight truth down the middle that they can absorb because he's going to go and they're going to be left. And so they need to grab everything that he's going to give them to start the church, to get the church off and running. It says there also up on the screen, a goes without saying truth today, whatever was most important then for his disciples ought to be important to me. Is it important to me? Is it important to you? Jesus runs through a couple parables. He talks about widows. He talks about a widow and her persistence. He talks about this judge and his mean spirit, his unjustness. And of course, he brings in this Pharisee and his arrogance, the publican and his humility. Jesus Christ is bringing some truth here, and he's teaching the disciples. Now again, it's always on us. What are you going to grab? What are you going to grasp? Because Jesus was the man the real man, the perfect man. But I wonder in this setting, and some say this when I read different people, they say, I wonder if he even laughed at them. Not in a sinful way, of course, Jesus didn't sin, but look at him like, what are you, what are you, I put you in a position, you have the position of judge and you treat this woman like this? You are a Pharisee that's supposed to be a religious leader and you talk like you're better than everybody else, which is he, his teaching that's been constantly through that. How do we approach the little things in our faith walk as Christians? We know prayer is a really big thing for us, and most would say they pray often. Even the lost pray. But have the little things that make prayer a big thing in our lives become ignored? I mentioned that a little bit ago. There's some little things here that are worth a lot. Because sometimes we just need a little thing to become something right in our lives to then make the big thing like prayer better little things can make our prayer life better you see the parable of the persistent widow and the parable of the pharisee and publican demonstrate jesus's in-depth teaching of a most important big thing to the disciples of jesus christ what are the little things that make prayer a really big thing to us. What are they? I'm going to get into them here. Because little things are big. They are big to Jesus. You know, don't sweat the small stuff. Well, it seems like Jesus sweats some small stuff here. And he wants us to sweat some of these. Now, it's a different look at it because it's really away from that axiom and that idiom because, of course, some of the small stuff eats us up. I'm talking about these little things that can lead to something big. Hudson Taylor said, if we are faithful to God in little things, we shall experience, gain experience and strength that will be helpful to us in the more serious trials of life. Hudson Taylor, missionary. Here's a famous coach, John Wooden, a quote from him, which if anybody's followed any good quotes over the years this man the believer strong man of god and he had some great stuff it's the little details that are vital he said little things make big things happen maybe today the little things will make the big thing of prayer much better in you and me little things okay here we go we're gonna knock this out so let's go to work First one's going to be off of verse number one. Here we go. Do not be faint-hearted. We end up quitting prayer when our heart gives up. It should be a place of endurance with God. Now, I put the word quitting in there. The meaning of it is to stop. If you quit something, you completely stop. I don't like when people say that. I've mentioned this before. Please don't tell me I'm done. Please don't tell me I quit. I know some of us have used that, but maybe we didn't really mean it. But if you're saying I quit, 
or I'm done, or I don't want to do this anymore. Oh my, if you quit your job and then you make a bad decision and you go back to your boss a week later and say, boy, can I have my job back? If that boss gives your job back to you, they're crazy. Because you've already decided that you quit. If you quit the ball team, and then you go back to the coach three or four days later and say, coach, I made, a, I made a mistake. Oh, my. You might be running for five years to get back on that team. And I don't know if a coach would take you back. But where am I at with this? It says there, men ought to pray. pray men, men ought not to faint. Do not be faint-hearted, which simply means this. We end up quitting prayer. We're in prayer. We're doing pretty good. We prayed for a few weeks, prayed for a few months. Maybe we prayed for two, three, four years, and then we quit prayer for some reason. It should be a place of simply enduring with God. He endures you. You ought to have a place of endurance with him. Don't be faint-hearted. To be faint means to be utterly spiritless. That's what the concordance says. To be wearied out and exhausted. Many of you are tired. Many of you are worn out. Well, I got to tell you, it's time maybe that you have a confrontation with God. And God has a confrontation with you. And you don't say to him, I quit. Because he has not quit on you. We somehow think that we can get back something off of a really bad decision or two or three or four and get it back to where it's got to be. There are miracles in that place in your walk with the Lord. But I will tell you, praying is definitely, definitely the contrary to fainting. You faint, I faint, we faint. Oh, my. People leave prayer for many reasons. I understand that. You know, when you share your story and your accounting of how rough life, I get it. it but just remember, it's not unique. Because throughout the Bible, I heard there was uh, the man who was called the Son of Man and the Son of God, and he kind of suffered a bit. Well, he's Jesus and he's perfect. Okay, so let's just open up a few of the Old Testament crazies. They're unbelievable. Joseph kind of went through a few tough times. Eee! Daniel went through a couple of tough times. And on and on it goes. And yet they called out to God. They went to God. I heard this guy named Paul. He could write about it. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. I got it up on the screen. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse number 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received ministry, we faint not. This is a place of endurance with God. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Thank you, God. We have been called to the ministry, the ministry of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number 14, 15, 16, I believe I have there. Is that what I got? 14, 15, let me think. 16 through 18, right at the end of the chapter. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. I know Pastor Brian loves this passage, like a life verse of his life. For our light of fiction, which be is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and weighty, an eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We faint not. Church together, we need not faint. We individually need not faint. The little things. This is one of the little things. Do not be faint-hearted. Second little thing. Do not be weak-minded. Back to verses 2 through 5, I believe. I've got it knocked down. 2 through 5. This is when, of course, Jesus is telling this parable unto them to this end. Hey, don't faint. Don't faint. Well, do not be weak-minded. We end up failing in prayer when our thoughts wander. It should be a place of persistence for God. Have you learned from this woman a few verses here about her life? She's persistent, this widow. There's an unjust judge here. This person, this woman, number one, being a woman, coming to the judge on her own, as they move this judging tent that represents 
God's law and moves from place to place to represent the area. This judge is now, this, this woman had the persistence and the courage to go to him as a woman. Secondly, of course, she's on her own. She's divorced oh, or, of course, widowed in a package. Which she, she, doesn't, she doesn't have and so she's a widow, she's divorced, which simply means she no longer is married. She's not going to be recognized by the priest, and she doesn't have to be, but she persists because thirdly, we know, she doesn't have any man to take care of her. She's poor. Woman, widowed, poor. Standing in the court for her, <clears throat> That's a rough setting right there. But she cannot be weak-minded. We cannot be weak-minded. It's one of the little things that lead to something big, and it should be that we're persistent. I know you've heard a multiplicity of messages about prayer. What I'm just going after is this text showing us a couple of parables about, really about prayer, about going to the Lord. And this widow is going to someone who is in complete contrast to God. Do I fear not God, nor regard man, yet this widow troubled me. Boy, that's not the God that I know in Jesus Christ. He will hear my prayer. He will attend to my words. I must come before him with a broken and contrite spirit, a broken and contrite heart that will not despise. I come to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to make right with you. Please, I do not have a weak mind at this point. I'm not letting fear of failure get in the way. I'm not letting a lack of commitment get in the way. I'm not going to get to a point where I have this inability to control my emotions and I'm weak-minded. I need to be in a place where I'm persistent with you, God. First Thessalonians chapter number 5. It's up on the screen, verses 12 through 14. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly and to lose for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. That text is telling me is it's setting up for verse number 17 and all the commands that are given, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, on and on it goes. That means that in the body of Christ, maybe someone who is at a place of feeble-mindedness, maybe someone who's in a place where they're weak-minded, they've lost their way in prayer, they can really be recharged. Why don't you go to a prayer meeting sometime? Why don't you go and hang out with the group on 8 o'clock on Sunday morning that prays for missionaries? Maybe that will bring you to a place of encouraging one another as you pray without ceasing and you're not in a place where your mind has having wandering thoughts. Third one, another little thing that could make all the difference in the world up on the screen. Our third one says this, be not excuse me, do not be self-confident. Where's your confidence supposed to be? Go to 1 John chapter number three. Don't go there yet, B. We end up lukewarm, but I want you to go see 1 John three. So go there. I know a lot of you broke into this study that are in the uh, first hour with uh, Journey, and you guys have walked through 1 John. There's some good stuff about having confidence in the Lord. We end up lukewarm in prayer when our faith forgets. Because oftentimes our confidence is in ourselves. I remember when I did this, I remember when I did that. I have no problem with you accounting the times when God has done something. That's a good thing. It's in the Bible. But if we're constantly recounting the things that we have done or the things that someone else has done and we don't have God at the top of that thing, then we end up putting ourselves in a place where we're self-confident. Do not be self-confident. It's a little thing here. We end up lukewarm in prayer when our faith forgets it should be a place of protection by God. Look at what it says here in the Scripture in Luke chapter number uh, 18. You're over on first john i'll be there in one moment hear what the unjust judge saith and shall not god avenge his own elect god's going to take care of his people i said it earlier 
So would I want to be in a place where I know that God's going to protect me or I need to protect myself? There are things that you need to care for as a steward in your home, your life, your wife, your children, all that. I got that. But God is the one that you have to have confidence in to fulfill that. It should be a place of protection by God. This is what Jesus is teaching. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Jesus Christ is giving an account that his father will make sure to protect those that are his. You and I should have confidence in that. 1 John chapter number 3, verse 1, I believe, is up there. Uh, Excuse me, verse 21. Verse 21. Let me pick it up there. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Any of you remember what Brian Clark said on, on Friday evening? He had been in the mission field for a while, walking through the park. Park? The park. He was walking through the park. He's walking through the park. I am from New England. He's walking through the park. He stops at a bench and sits there and starts recounting Scripture. And he goes to uh, John's Gospel, chapter number 14, I believe. And he talked of how God reminded him of that Scripture. Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name. Asking you shall receive that your joy may be full. And it goes into, in John's Gospel, the same type of wording here in terms of being in God's will, doing that which God has commanded, and that you would believe, it says in verse number 23, on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. God will show you how, lead you to be confident completely in him. It should lead to a place of protection. And when you're in a place where you say, ah, you know what? I'm going to be self-confident. You will be lukewarm. We will be in that place where, ha, ha, what Jesus spoke of. The priest isn't going to do what my father can do for you. 1 John, I believe, chapter number 5 is up there as well, isn't it, B? It says up there, 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, according to his will, according to his will, he heareth us. There's so much more to this because, verse 15, and we know that he hear us Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Because we've kept his commandments, we're in Christ Jesus. Our confidence is in him. He will make it so that we are protected as we entrust everything over to him. The little things are big things to Jesus. The last couple, here you go. Number four, verses 9 through 12 in Luke chapter number 18. Do not be self-righteous. What happens when we're self-righteous? We end up perverting prayer when we exude pride. This Pharisee exuded pride. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men. And he goes on, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And Jesus using this parable is saying, hey, This should be a place of imperfection before God. That's what Jesus is teaching. This publican asks for mercy. Is there anyone that truly has gotten saved according to the scriptures and the gospel that doesn't say, thank you, God, for your mercy? You say it's grace, yes, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. On the other side of calling on the name of the Lord to save you, and he saves your soul, you go, thank you for saving me. Your mercy endures forever. Your mercy over what I deserve is that you have pulled it, and in your justice system, you put it upon your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not be self-righteous. It should be a place of imperfection before God. A little thing. God, be merciful to me. God, I have sinned as your son and your child, and I just got to tell you, I've got to repent of that stuff. I'm done with walking with my mouth running before I really engage you. Lord God, forgive me. 
God, I need you to make me better. God, I have decided to repent of that matter. Just like at the beginning of Luke chapter number 17, as Jesus teaches his disciples, if someone repents and asks for forgiveness, you forgive them. Philippians chapter number three, all of you are familiar, or most of you, I won't say all, but a lot of you are familiar with Paul writing in the letter to the Philippians. He says, of course, in Philippians, I've got nine through 11, I didn't grab eight. Yea, doubtless I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. He counts all things done that I may win Christ, verse nine. And he found in him, be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, by faith. Your self-righteousness doesn't do well, right? Believers, we know that. You've got saved from your own self-righteousness that you could save yourself. If you're lost today and you're trying to find a way to earn your way to heaven in your own self-righteousness, Paul the apostle say, man, it was anybody that could have earned their way it would be me, but I put down my righteousness. I'm no longer self-righteous. I am God-righteous. I am righteous in the Lord. This is a little thing that makes your prayer life big. If you don't want to have a big prayer life or just at least have a prayer life that's biblical, then these little things probably don't matter. But if you do, they can matter to you. That I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, be it made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Paul is saying it very clear for us. He's got a handle on this package of little things that make this prayer life big and if you track down paul a little bit you find that he had an incredible life of prayer lastly it says up on the screen one more little thing do not be matter of fact what do you mean pastor do not be matter of fact we end up cheating prayer when we resist the communion the communion with God, the closeness with God. We, we cheat prayer when we resist getting closer. Oh, if I get closer, then I'm going to have that red-hot passion, and then I'm going to have to go, then let God take care of that. Why don't you just jump in and say, God, I want this really close relationship with you in prayer, in worship, in communing with you. It should be a place of profession before God, a place where we profess you know we couldn't get out of this message without Hebrews 4. Let's go to Hebrews 4 and we'll finish. Hebrews chapter number 4. Hebrews chapter number 4. I've got verses up on the screen to help you out. This is about our profession. Jesus Christ is addressing all the tribes of Israel. He's addressing all the Jews in the setting. There's some converted Jews. There's some not converted Jews. But as we look at the practical aspect of this passage of Scripture, we realize in Christ, who is our high priest, we have this incredible access, do we not? Verse 14, chapter number 4 of Hebrews. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. This is one of the little things. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus says this publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes to heaven, smote himself on his breast, a place of contrition, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Do not be self-righteous. Do not be self-controlled. Do not be matter-of-fact. Do not be weak-minded. Do not be faint-hearted. These little things can make prayer in your life and my life through Jesus' teaching the big thing that it deserves to be in the place of our lives, believers. If you're lost today, then 
prayer is maybe something where you just give it a try. Maybe I can say a prayer, a certain prayer to get God's attention. Well, I would be more than happy to talk to you after service about what it means to know Jesus Christ as Savior and how he can be your high priest. And he's the one that will be at the centerpiece of the profession of your faith. And then you'll have access to holy God. It says on our screen for invitation, this time of prayer, here you go. We really need to look at the little things of prayer to make prayer a big thing in our lives as Christians, as a Christian. What can we do about that today? What can we do? I ask you to consider, is there one little thing, one little thing that each of us can make better in our prayer life? Why don't you stand with me? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? As my sister Debbie starts some music in the background, let me pray with you. You can come forward if you'd like and do some business with God over what you see up on that screen or whatever God has spoken to you about in our passage of Scripture. But let me pray for you. Our God in heaven, I, I just extend to you all my thankfulness, all my heart of gratitude for who you are and what you've given me, given us as believers in Jesus Christ, the access to pray to you through the high priest, Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for always, always being the one, the high priest that will hear and not as the accounting of the parable of the unjust. I pray for this invitation time that your people would respond to your call, to your, your stirring of our waters. May we have something that we truly can make better, one of the little things to make our prayer life better. In Jesus' name. As the music plays.